morning, church. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, today is our service for wholeness and healing. You see that in your bulletin. You should have little yellow slips, quarter-sized slips in your pews, or in your pews, in your bulletins. If you don't have one and you need one, there, are, there should be some in the bulletins out in the foyer. You can just go grab another one. They're, they're small and they sort of slip out. So, um, but what this is for today is a service where um, after the sermon you will be given opportunity if you so desire to come forward and be anointed with oil and prayed over, the elders of the church to pray over you, women on one side, men on another, um, if you have um, areas of your life that you desire healing. And wholeness. So um, just want to give you a heads up for that so you are ready for that. Um, um, make sure when you fill out that little slip that you put your name at the top. Sometimes I think people forget to put their name there. Heavenly Father, help us to attend now to your word, to your instruction manual, um, so that we might hear what it is that you have to teach us so that you can transform us and make us more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Every single person born on earth needs to be healed from the same disease. Every single person born on earth needs to be healed from the same disease. We are all born sinners in need of the only lasting antidote, and that's salvation given in Jesus Christ, the Lord. The Apostle Peter proclaimed, as we read in Acts 4, 12, let's read this together. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Salvation alone heals us from our sin-sick condition that we're all born with. And the primary mission of the church of Jesus Christ is to bring people to faith in him, is to make disciples of Jesus, is to, to teach people about Jesus. Because we don't want to just hear about Jesus, we want to know Jesus. And that's what we are supposed to do when we come to salvation in Christ. And that's always the primary goal of the church. In the book of Acts, every time those apostles got the chance, they retold the salvation story. Just read the book of Acts. They would just go back and rehearse, and they would retell the salvation story. They would call people to repent of their sins, to put their faith in Jesus Christ, and to step into a new life freed from Satan's clutches. Salvation of our souls is the ultimate healing and is the ultimate mission of the church of Jesus Christ. But here's the reality of life on earth. Even when our souls have been eternally saved from the clutches of the devil, our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our relationships, our finances, our churches, our vocations, our families, etc., are all still under attack, constantly under attack. And we all know this is true, whether that attack is coming from inside of us or whether that attack is coming from outside of us. Thursday, I was able to attend the concert down at the elementary school for the pre-K pre through third graders. And it was great to see our church kids, you know, singing their hearts out down there. And I always enjoy it, but I observe something too. And we observe the same thing every Sunday for, during children's sermon, that you've got a kid who wants to be good, and then you've got a kid beside them who, you know, all of a sudden starts talking and looking around and poking, right? And so what happens to the kid beside him? Next thing you know, usually that kid starts looking around and poking. And, you know, so what happened to that first kid that made that first kid unruly? It was inside of them. It was the rebellious nature. It came from inside. What happened to the second kid? It came from outside. It came from the distraction coming from outside of them. And we are all constantly being deluged, right, with opportunities to take either the high road of righteousness or the low road of rebellion rebelliousness, whether our souls have been saved or not. Now, as an example, on April 27th, the Los Angeles Angels traded baseball player Josh Hamilton back to the Texas Rangers 
as he tries once again to get his life back on track. This, this kid, he's not a kid anymore. This, this man has struggled for years with issues of drugs and alcohol. But in recent years, he seemed to be doing pretty well. In fact, he and his wife, Katie, were out on the speaker circuit telling everybody about their faith in Jesus Christ and, and, and the challenge it was to overcome past addictions, past being the key word. And then in January, he had a relapse and went back to cocaine usage. And now a divorce is in process. And in fact, as part of that divorce, the, the divorce uh, names 34 requests, including prohibiting his wife from hiding their children from him. For now, he can only see his children with supervision. What happened? I mean, I dare to say that Josh Hamilton, his soul was saved a long time ago. I would dare to say that his wife, Katie, her soul was saved a long time ago, had received that ultimate healing. I don't know the ages of their kids, but I would hope that they too have put their faith in Jesus Christ. But oh my, there is healing needed there. I mean, very obviously, healing from addiction and healing from broken relationships now. I mean, for me, having grown up in a, in a home affected by divorce, for a whole year of my life, I wasn't allowed to see my dad. I can tell you that it takes time and it takes effort and it takes energy to heal from the kind of hurt and the kind of pain that comes against us in this broken world, mostly because the devil gets in there and he tells us lies about what's going on. And for a lot of kids, they come to believe that somehow they are to blame if their parents are having marital problems. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to constantly blame us for things that are, that are beyond our control altogether. Why? Because that's what he does. Because he's a thief. He comes only, we read in John 10.10, he comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And he wants us to doubt our salvation, that ultimate healing. He wants us to doubt that by getting us to doubt God's goodness, that's what happened to Adam and Eve, doubt God's power, and yes, even doubt God's very existence. And I dare to say that most, if not all of us, have been in that place at one time or another in our lives. I mean, maybe some of you are there even today. But listen, take heart, because in the days of the early church, they had a lot of things they were doubting too. They had all sorts of things coming against them, just like we do. And so you know what God did? God kept fanning the flame of faith by giving miraculous healings. And the church ended up growing because people saw God's power at work in their own lives and in the lives of the people around them. There were physical healings in the days of the early church. Let's look at this from Acts 5. Yet more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's, Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. A great number of people would also gather from the towns around Jerusalem, see more and more people, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. They were all cured physical healings, and there were spiritual healings. I mean, think about that story of the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember that story? This guy's coming from Jerusalem. He's in the chariot, and he's reading the prophet Isaiah, and he can't understand it, and God sent the apostle Philip to explain the scriptures to him so that he could understand them, and pointing, obviously, to that the Old Testament is always pointing to salvation given in Jesus Christ. And the man, looking out of the window of his chariot, looks out, he sees some water, and he says, What's, well, here's some water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? And he was baptized, and he went on his way rejoicing. Spiritual healing. Spiritual healing. Think about the guy named Saul in the Scripture. He was traveling to Damascus, and he had this amazing experience. A bright light came to him on the road, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. But Saul couldn't see. He couldn't see for three days. He didn't eat, and he didn't drink. And then God sent this man named Ananias to come and lay hands on Saul. 
Now, Ananias didn't want to do it because he had heard about Saul, and he thought, you know, he didn't know if he was safe if he went to Saul. But he did it out of obedience to the Lord. He laid his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Saul became Paul, who became one of the greatest witnesses for the church of Jesus Christ, who ended up writing 13 out of 27 of the books of the New Testament. Spiritual healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, and there was intellectual healing. Now, maybe some might call it a different kind of healing. When Peter saw this vision that salvation was given not just for the Jews, but for all people, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. See, what he had believed, what he had been taught all of these years was corrected by God. That's To me, that's intellectual healing. He was corrected by God. And he said, I truly understand in that now that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right, it is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And the Holy Spirit then came and and fell powerfully on Jews and Gentiles. And Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Physical healing, spiritual healing, intellectual healing, and there was financial healing. We read in Acts 2 and Acts 4 over the last couple of weeks how people came to the place where they began to understand that what God had given to them was not just for them alone so they could build their own little kingdoms, but God had given them resources so they could be about expanding the kingdom of God. And they began to see the purpose of their time as an opportunity to serve the Lord, to serve the Lord. And there is no talk of retirement, you know, in the Bible. You've probably heard that before. Why? Because the main purpose, the main, the ultimate job of every believer is, is to expand the kingdom of God in word and in deed, which is so freeing because what that means is that the ultimate job is ours until our very last breath. People were raised from the dead in the book of Acts. In Acts 20, we read Luke's words about this extraordinary event. And I'm going to read this from the paraphrase of the scripture called The Voice. The Sunday night before our Monday departure, we gathered to celebrate the breaking of bread. Many wondrous events happen as Paul travels ministering among the churches. And one evening, a most unusual event occurs. Imagine you're celebrating with them. We are in an upstairs room with the gentle light and shadows cast by several lamps. Paul is carrying on an extended dialogue with the believers, taking advantage of every moment since we planned to leave at first light. The conversation stretches on until midnight, and a young fellow named Eutychus, seeing some fresh, seeking some fresh air, moves to an open window. Paul keeps on talking. Eutychus perches in the open window itself. Paul keeps talking. Eutychus drifts off to sleep. Paul continues talking until Eutychus, now overcome by deep sleep, drops out of the window and falls three stories to the ground where he is found dead. Paul joins us downstairs, bends over, and takes Eutychus in his arms, and Paul says, it's okay, he's alive again. Then Paul goes back upstairs, celebrates the breaking of bread, and just as you might guess, keeps on conversing until first light. Then he leaves. I should add that Eutychus had been taken home long before his friends more than a little relieved that the boy was alive. There's a resurrection in the book of Acts. Not just that one, but others. And we learn in John 14, verse 12, Jesus said to his disciples, listen to this, very truly I tell you that the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. How can we do greater works? Because there's more of us. And he's headed up to the Father. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus told us to go, therefore, and continue his ministry because all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him to commission us in the name and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. 
We talked about last week a flourishing church. A flourishing church is a place, folks, where Jesus Christ is lifted up as the only way of salvation, where the truth of, of God's word is taught and preached and lived out in word and in deed, and where people believe that God's healing power is here right now through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, ready to be released to the glory of his wonderful name. And it's in this flourishing environment then where people can drop their pride and admit their need, admit their afflictions and admit their need. I mean, pride says, I'm fine, I don't need any prayers. You know, pride says, I can, instead of saying, you know what, only God can. You get rid of your pride, you're able to say to others, you know what, my marriage is a mess, and my spouse and I, we need to get before the Lord, we need to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Our marriage needs healing. You drop your pride, you're able to say to somebody else, you know what, I, I struggle with panic attacks, and I need, I need healing from my fears. Or say, my family is broken, and, and, and you know what? I repent of my part of it. I know I'm part of it. I repent of my part of it, and I ask God for healing in my family. Or I can't sleep at night. I need Jesus to give me rest. Or I'm addicted. I'm addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or nicotine or work. Or I'm addicted to cleaning or money or needing everybody's approval or texting or checking my Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever. I need Jesus to heal me of this so that I can be completely devoted to him, not devoted to things that pull me away from him. Or... I'm angry all the time, and I repent of this. I need Jesus to fill me with peace. I need healing. Or I feel depressed or discouraged or disappointed most of the time, and I want the joy of the Lord. I need healing. Or I've been abused physically, emotionally, sexually, verbally. I need God's healing power in my heart. Or I have arthritis or cancer or I have diabetes or I've got stomach problems or I'm having trouble seeing or hearing. I want to be healed. Some of you might remember the story I told a couple of years ago, but it just bears repeating because it just... To me, it's just so powerful that there was this moment I was heading up to Timmins. I'd been over here and I was just so... I'll just say angry with God because it seemed like we were just praying and praying and praying for so many people and, and they weren't getting better and they were young and it was and my heart was just broken. And I was saying to God, you know what? You told us that if we agree with on, on earth anything that, and then ask you for it, that you would do it for us. And that, it doesn't seem to be working very well. Do our prayers make any difference at all to what's going on here on earth? Just yelling at God, which is okay, you know. The Bible says it's okay. In the book of Psalms, you'll see David ranting at God. And after I got quiet and just kept driving, a still small boy said to me, the Lord said these words to me, you do not know how many people I have healed. Which just shut me up. Because I knew it was true. And that's what God's word does, okay? When the devil's lies are kicked out and God's word, God's truth comes in, you know what happens? It shuts us up. And it gets us on our knees and humbles us before the Lord. Because you know what's true? We have prayed for thousands and thousands of people through the ministry of this church, millions of people through the ministry of this church since 1766. You pray for people at home, in your car, in your chair, in your bed, on your knees, laying prostrate. You are praying for people I know as I am. We're praying for people all the time. And we have no idea how many people have been healed because we have prayed for them. Things that we have prayed for them that we knew about and things that we didn't know anything about and God chose to heal them. We have no idea how many times our prayers resulted in some measure of improvement in somebody's condition. We have no idea how many times our prayers resulted in the right doctor walking into the right room at just the right time to give the right treatment to the right patient. We have no idea how many times that has happened. 
And see, what the devil wants us to do, he wants us to get stuck in a place where we, we, we think that we know what healing looks like. It's some spontaneous, complete, perfect fix. And sometimes it does look like that, but sometimes it doesn't look like that. But God's way is the best way. Who knows how many times God has intervened in our own lives and given us healing, and we haven't even recognized it. I'll tell you what I know. The ultimate healing of the salvation of my soul changed everything for me. It brought healing to my broken heart of what happened with my family. It changed everything for me. And because I know that it is well with my soul, I want it also to be well with my mind and my body and my emotions and my finances and my marriage and my relationships here with my church family and my relationships with my biological family. I want everything to match. I want healing in every part of my life so that there is nothing, nothing blocking the light of Christ from shining out of my life into a broken world. And that's what God wants for every single one of us. And you know what it takes? It takes honest confession. It takes repentance, turning away from sin. And it takes obedience, following in the footsteps of Jesus on that narrow pathway. It takes us laying down our pride and admitting our need, admitting our afflictions and our needs to the Lord in prayer. And it needs believing that that God hears and that God sees and that God knows and that God does continue to heal us for our ultimate good and for his eternal glory so that the church of Jesus Christ may flourish. I mean, the church is his body, the body of his beloved son on earth. Doesn't he want the church to flourish? Of course he does. And so God continues to heal so that his church may flourish as his resurrection power pours into us and through and around us. So would you join me, please, as we move into a time of confession? Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God knows our needs before we ask. And in our asking, prepares us to receive the gift of grace. Let us open our lives to God's healing presence, forsaking all that separates us from God and neighbor. Let us be mindful not only of personal evil, but also of our communal sins of family, class, race, and nation. Let us confess to God whatever has wounded us or brought injury to others, that we may receive mercy and become for each other ministers of God's grace. Let's go to the Lord silently in confession. Let's join together in our unison prayer. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sin, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and set us free from bondage to our offenders. Deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts confident in our status as heirs with Christ, we may draw near to you, having confessed our sin, trusting in your grace, trusting in your loving gaze upon us, and finding in you our refuge and our strength through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.